afternoon to our witnesses. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the interactions states have with the federal government as they seek to manage the fish and wildlife resources within their borders. Since the founding of our republic, the states, not the federal government, and a lot of people, I think, uh, have a misunderstanding of this very important principle, but states have had the primacy over the management of wildlife within their borders. In the case of, of Alaska, for example, our Statehood Act, passed by Congress, even included language to affirmative, uh, affirmatively transfer management authority of fish and wildlife management to the state. By reserving certain powers to various states, the unique needs of each of those states to manage and control their resources are preserved, and that's why there's traditionally state management for all states. Alaska, for example, has an excellent history of sustainably managing our own fish and wildlife resources for the benefit of our citizens, and when the federal government and the states have been able to work cooperatively, which we usually do, whether through the Pittman-Robertson or Dingell-Johnson Acts or other directions from Congress, species in the overall management have, been, have significantly benefited. Having entered the Union on equal footing, all states enjoy management authority unless modified or diminished by an act of Congress. And there are many examples of this where Congress does act to preempt state management authority, whether the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Bald and Gold Eagle Protection Act, Title VIII of ANILCA. These are all examples where the federal government has taken that management authority and preempted it. I'm not always in favor of such preemption, but, authorities, but the authorities of these acts aren't nearly as damaging to our states and to our federal federalism system of government as ones carried out by agency fiat. And that, in many ways, is what we're going to focus on today, where the federal government, where the Congress makes clear that the federal government has authority. Agencies clearly have that prerogative. States abide by that. The broader concern is where it's not clear and federal agencies take action that don't seem to focus on the rule of law or federal statutes. Again, in my state, conservation is not only a matter critical to our quality of life and customs and traditions, it is also a matter of social justice for our remote communities who depend on nature's bounty for food. Anytime the federal government intrudes into our sovereign responsibilities to sustain and manage fish and wildlife, populations, it is of great concern to all Alaskans. And again, one thing I want to emphasize, a, a, a theme that develops sometimes, unfortunately, in this committee is that it's always partisan. One side only wants to protect the environment. I think we all want to protect the environment. Most of these concerns, in my experience, are very bipartisan in terms of protecting the environment, but also in terms of how states manage their resources. That's why in one major newspaper recently in Alaska, the newspaper referred to a proposed rule, recently proposed from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that would preempt Alaska's management of fish and game in the following way. Quote, Alaskans should be clearly concerned, even alarmed, that these proposed rules by the federal government are just more in a long line of attempts by the federal government to amend the Alaska Statehood Act and have preemption in terms of fish and wildlife management. Last fall, the National Park Service finalized similar rules that would pro pro prohibit several forms of hunting in preserves in Alaska and would allow superintendents to simply post a notice online preempting state wildlife laws and regulations. Calling the rule overarching, vague, and indiscriminate, the Alaska Federation of Natives passed a resolution in opposition. Again, a group that's very bipartisan in my state. That same resolution stated, other federal agencies such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also apply various rules that interfere with traditional resource management practice that reduces subsistence access 
to our citizen, citizens. In both cases, the rules are being preempted, are, are based on practices that subsistence hunters requested to the Alaska Board of Game, again, in an open public process to provide food security for passing on their traditional practices. We're all fortunate to have three very distinguished witnesses here today to look forward to a more detailed discussion on this important issue of the interchange between federal and state management of our important wildlife resources. And I'm glad to have the uh, witnesses here, and I'm glad to have my ranking member, Senator Whitehouse, uh, join me for this important hearing and turn to him for his opening statement. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. It's good to be with you. Looking at the uh, witness testimony and the scope of this hearing, I guess I should first note that although the word environment is in the name of this committee, that does not mean that we get to stake claim to all things water and all things soil. Uh, in the written testimony, te testimonies of both Mr. Vincent Lang and Mr. Regan, there are references to, to the National Park Service. Though the relationships of state fish and wildlife agencies with other federal agencies like the National Park Service and Forest Service may be worth reviewing, they are not uh, jurisdictional to this committee. It is also worth pointing out that a critical witness is not present at today's hearing. Though the bulk of testimony and discussion from this hearing will be focused on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, its director, Dan Ash, was not invited to participate. In a discussion about the Fish and Wildlife Service's rules and regulations and how they're affecting state agencies, the service should be here to explain and, if necessary, defend its actions. The problems here may be regional, but whatever the issue, I should note that many states managed to get along very well with these federal agencies. Successful cooperation and collaboration between state and federal agencies, I would argue, is actually the norm. Serious conflicts are an anomaly. In my state, Rhode Island, Kathy Sparks, Assistant Director of Natural Resources at the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, notes, quote, a spirit of collaboration in the Northeast between state fish and wildlife agencies and their U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service counterparts. Rhode Island has a, quote, good working relationship with the service, especially with issues concerning national wildlife refuges and Endangered Species Act implementation. Assistant Director Spark shared particular appreciation for the Fish and Wildlife Service's willingness to maintain what she called an open dialogue with the state and a track record of being both reasonable and forthcoming. I don't think the Rhode Island experience is unique. As Mr. Barry indicated in his testimony, Nick Wiley, Executive Director of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, mirrored the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management's comments in noting, quote, the long standing collaborative and positive relationships that his state has with the service. Effective management of our country's land, air, water, and wildlife is reliant upon cooperation between states and federal government. We are not one sovereign or another, they are dual sovereigns. Throughout the many statutes that govern natural resource management and the relationship between federal and state authorities, the words collaboration, cooperation, and in consultation with litter the text. Though states are given significant deference in federal fish and wildlife decision making, the laws make clear that state interests cannot come at the cost of conservation, especially not on public lands that are held in trust for the enjoyment of all Americans. So I look forward to working with you on this. I understand that Alaska has particular concerns and perhaps those can be dealt with on a state or regional basis, but I would uh, contest any premise that this is a national categorical problem, certainly based on Rhode Island's experience. We have a terrific relationship with uh, our federal counterparts, and I think many states enjoy and manage to accomplish the same. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. I want to welcome our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Ron Regan, the Executive Director of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, Mr. Doug, Doug Vincent Lang, the former director of the Alaska Division of Wildlife Conservation, and Mr. Don Barry, the senior vice president of the conservation program at the Defenders of Wildlife. Witnesses have five minutes to deliver their oral statements. A longer written statement will be included in the record. Uh, very excited to have a, such a distinguished group of 
witnesses here today. Uh, Mr. Regan, why don't we begin with you? You have five minutes to deliver your statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Sullivan and Ranking Democrat White House for the opportunity to share with you our perspectives on federal interaction with state management of fish and wildlife. As the introduction suggested, I am Ron Reagan, Executive Director of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, of which all 50 state fish and wildlife agencies are members. The association's mission, which has not changed significantly from our founding in 1902, is to protect state agency authority to conserve and manage the fish and wildlife within their borders. State governments hold title to fish and wildlife as trustees of these resources for their citizens. Regulating take for hunting and fishing resides under that authority. Case law at all levels up to the Supreme Court upholds that trustee ownership in the state agencies. Where Congress has given federal agencies certain conservation responsibilities and thus authority for fish and wildlife, Congress has also affirmed that state jurisdiction is concurrent with the federal authority starting with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918 and continuing for federally listed threatened and endangered species under the ESA and certain migratory and anadromous fish under the Anadromous Fish Conservation Act. Congress affirmed state agency authority for fish and wildlife management on federal lands in organic acts for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, and Department of Defense military installations. Each statute directs that to the maximum extent practicable, hunting and fishing seasons and bag limits shall conform to state agency regulations. In general, state agencies enjoy a good working relationship with the federal agencies, but they strive constantly to improve that for the benefit of fish and wildlife resources and constituents. Contemporary examples include state federal task force collaboration on administration of the wildlife and sport fish restoration program and federal implementation of the ESA. Recent conservation success stories for greater sage grouse, lesser prairie chicken, monarch butterflies, and the New England cottontail attest to the strength of the state federal partnership. That being said, my written testimony suggests there are foundational jurisdictional concerns with managing elk in Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota, recreational fisheries ma management and access in the Biscayne National Park of Florida, and wilderness designations for two national forests in Arizona. However, today I will focus my brief time on proposed rulemaking for Alaskan's Nas Alaskan National Wildlife Refuges and Preserves that would change how the Alaska Department of Fish and Game manages fish and wildlife resources on those refuges. The association appreciates the chair's accepted amendment to the Bipartisan Sportsman's Act, which would prohibit the Fish and Wildlife Service from further action on its proposed regulation and preclude implementation of the like National Park Service regulation. The association has requested a comment period extension and we will continue to work with the Fish and Wildlife Service to address our concerns. If enacted, the proposed rule would usurp Alaska's authority to manage fish and wildlife for sustained yield, including predators and large ungulates, on national wildlife refuges in favor of a hands-off or, pa or passive management paradigm, which would adversely impact Alaska fish and game objectives for resident fish and wildlife. The proposed rule takes what is now national policy on biological integrity, diversity, and environmental health and elevates it to a regulation, thereby giving it preeminence in Alaska over other national wildlife refuge policy and also over ANILCA. This action may result in litigation that seeks to apply that policy to the entire national wildlife refuge system under the argument that what is good for Alaska should be good for all refuges, given that it is a national system. A recent public relations appeal by the Humane Society of the United States to support this proposed rule already refers to it as applying to all national wildlife refuges. I'll conclude my remarks with two legislative and policy remedies among several that were offered in my written testimony. First, the use of savings clauses in federal law with respect to state authority for fish and wildlife management needs some revision 
and certainly more prominent placement in statutes or legislation than it now occupies. Second, the association recommends revising the, revising the several federal agency organic acts to define with more certainty and clarity the phrase in cooperation with the states at the appropriate places which directs fish and wildlife management on federal lands and or in statutes that recognize the concurrent jurisdiction of state agencies with federal agencies for fish and wildlife. The association would be pleased to work with committee staff on both provisions and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to share these remarks. Thank you, Mr. Reagan. Mr. Berry. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to uh, just summarize five points from my testimony that's being submitted formally to the record. Um, unfortunately, hearings like this can create the false impression that the rare exception of problems and conflict is actually the norm. And it's what I referred to in my testimony is it gets you to start focusing on the hole instead of the donut. Um, I think my testimony, including the uh, uh, quotes from the State Fishing Game Director in Florida, indicates what is the norm throughout most of the United States. And he described uh, the working relationship that he had with the Fish and Wildlife Service and with the other state directors in his region and the Fish and Wildlife Service as the no daylight policy. From his perspective, there was no daylight between the state Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And he acknowledged that there will be some disagreements and even some strong disputes, but they work together to work through them and then they move on. So he felt it was an extremely constructive relationship and he thought that he, he believed that most of the national directors or most of the state directors throughout the nation would feel the same way. Um, one court um, referred to this relationship as cooperative federalism. Um, and I think that's a, a term that describes the way it's worked fairly well. Um, I would also believe that given the overwhelming success in the Fish and Wildlife Service and the states working together, that no compelling case has been made yet. Um, that there needs to be a significant change or amendments to the underlying federal laws and that Congress should not do so now. I would also then like to just shift my focus to ANILCA, since that seems to be the primary focus of this hearing. It's my view that ANILCA does not require the Fish and Wildlife Service to accept lock, stock, and barrel, the state of Alaska's anti-predator program uh, for national wildlife refuges. And in fact, I think my testimony clearly demonstrates that ANILCA requires the exact opposite and requires the Fish and Wildlife Service to reject an outdated, such an outdated approach to hammering predators on wildlife refuges as required by the state of Alaska's intensive management legislation. I would note that even the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game's 1982 MOU acknowledged the authority and the responsibility of the Fish and Wildlife Service to reject the state's animal damage control program where and when it believes it's incompatible with the purposes for a given refuge. So even in 1982, the state of Alaska acknowledged that the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service was only required to substantially try to accommodate the uh, state fish and game uh, predator control program, but was not obligated to do so. You know, it's our, our view, my view, <clears throat> that national wildlife refuges in Alaska were intended to be a lot more than just game factories for sport hunters. ANILCA's natural diversity management goal for each wildlife refuge, which is included in section 302 and 303 of ANILCA, um, requires, oh, and I should also note that in 302 and 303 of ANILCA, which set up the, or expanded the wildlife refuges in Alaska, a number of those um, new units specifically mentioned bears and wolves as some of the key species that those wildlife refuges were being created um, to focus on. So <clears throat> from my perspective, um, when Congress added the requirement that national wildlife refuges um, in Alaska be managed to conserve in the natural diversity, the species of key focus in those refuges, and it included various different wolves and bears in some of the different refuges, it seems to me to be <clears throat> um, impossible to conclude that Alaska under ANILCA was being given the authority and the power to go in and to adopt a very heavy anti-predator program designed to suppress the population levels of predators within those um, national wildlife refuges. All, it's very clear also under ANILCA that all sport hunting in the national wildlife refuges in Alaska needs to be compatible and consistent with that natural diversity management goal. Um, it's unfortunate also, I, I believe, that um, an amendment has been adopted to the bipartisan sportsman's bill to block the ability of the Fish and Wildlife Service to finalize their rule 
Um, and I think it's just going to increase the likelihood that that bill may not ever be accepted and, and adopted by the administration and might generate a, a veto. I should also say that the wildlife management and refuge provisions in ANILCA are not in conflict with the 1997 Refuge Improvement Act, and that both statutes um, can apply and are in sync. The Alaska refuges are to be managed under ANILCA and um, be managed under the Natural Diversity um, Management Goal, and all National Wildlife Refuges under the 1997 Refuge Improvement Act are, be are to be managed under a new, broader management mission and vision for the National Wildlife Refuge System to ensure that biological integrity, diversity, and environmental health of each refuge in the system is maintained. Therefore, it's my view that there is no conflict between the requirement under ANILCA to manage for natural diversity and the requirement under the 1997 Act to <clears throat> manage for the biological integrity, diversity, and environmental health of each refuge. Um, I will, my time's up, so I'll quit at that point and look forward to taking questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Barry, and I appreciate your interest in ANILCA, as you can imagine. Um, Mr. Vincent Lang, your testimony, please, sir. Senator Sullivan, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss federal overreach into wildlife management in my state, Alaska. My name is Doug Vincent Lang. Today I will speak as a representative of Safari Club International and from my perspective as a former state chief wildlife manager. SCI is a world leader in preserving the freedom to hunt and promoting wildlife conservation. And our chapters in Alaska are some of the most effective hunter conservation groups in my state. When you consider the uniqueness of Alaska's relationship with its wildlife resources, it's not surprising that the framers of my state's constitution required active management of my state's fish and game for their sustained yield and its many benefits it provides. It is also not surprising that the historic intent and incredible wisdom of the framers of the U.S. Constitution that reserve certain powers to the individual states become crystal clear. This includes a recognition that it is responsibility of the states to manage and control their natural resources for their unique needs. And for Alaska, Congress specifically recognized and guaranteed Alaska's right to manage and control its resources under our state constitution as part of our statehood compact. Over the past decade, my state has begun to experience increased administrative intrusions by federal agencies into the management of our fish and game that seem unresolvable, giving increasingly divergent administrative management philosophies. The intrusions are wide-ranging. They include misuse of the Endangered Species Act. As an example, let's look at the ring seal. These seals were listed as a threatened species based solely on speculative model forecasting possible reductions over a 100-year time frame. Yet these seals currently number in the millions and are expected to remain at these numbers through mid-century. Such listings are unnecessary and allow federal agencies to exert management control over the listed species as well as their landscapes. The National Park Service recently finalized new regulations governing wildlife in Alaska's national preserves over my state's objection. In these regulations, the Park Service closed preserves to hunting opportunities despite there being no conservation concerns. The Park Service chose to substitute their agency ethics and values as to what constitutes appropriate hunting methods, ignoring publicly adopted state regulations that allowed those practices. Now we see the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service propose new rules that administratively exert federal management control over wildlife in Alaska's national wildlife refuges. These rules fundamentally will alter the federal government's longstanding wildlife management relationship with Alaska. The services using their administratively adopted biological integrity policy to third protections of state management authority that Congress included in the National Wildlife System Improvement Act and in the Alaska National Interest Lands Claim Conservation Act both of which confirm deference to state management authority. By incorporating national diversity policies into their permanent regulations, the service is replacing, is replacing time-proven traditional active state management with a hands-off management approach. Let me give you a real example of how this plays out in the real world. On Unimac Island in Alaska, the service has elevated natural diversity and its hands-off management philosophy over sound principles of wildlife management. On this island, without active management of both predator and prey populations, an indigenous caribou population has a high likelihood of disappearing. The service determined that under their natural diversity guidelines, it would be acceptable for the caribou on this island to, in the service's own words, blink out. This despite one of the refuge's congressionally established purposes being the conservation of these very caribou and their subsistence uses. The application of this hands-off approach throughout Alaska's refuges could put many other populations of moose, caribou, deer, and elk at risk. 
and as a result, seriously reduce opportunities for hunters, including subsistence hunters. Under a hands-off approach, it is questionable whether Alaska will be allowed to continue to actively manage its sheep and bear populations for trophy hunting opportunities. Will Alaska be allowed to continue to actively manage its salmon runs for optimal sustained yield, since that's an active management program? Will subsistence hunters be required to adopt fair chase standards? Taken together, these agency actions and others represent an unprecedented administrative intrusion by federal agencies into the state's traditional role as a principal manager of fish and wildlife. It is occurring despite congressional assurances through a variety of legislative savings clauses which statutorily preserve the state authority to manage. In Alaska, it is preventing my state from fulfilling our sustained yield mandates that our Constitution tells us we must and is impacting my state's ability to manage and provide sustained hunting and fishing opportunities. Those who will suffer the most are those who hunt and fish in Alaska, including subsistence hunters. We ask Congress to work with us to preserve the rights and opportunities of Alaskan hunters and fishers to present, prevent these federal intrusions. The state fish and game model is a proven success that should be built on, not replaced with a new one-size-fits-all federal conservation model. We need congressional action to stop these administrative intrusions, and Safari Club applauds the efforts of Senator Sullivan's towards this end. Safari Club International asks Congress for assistance towards this end and in protecting Alaska's hunters. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vincent Lang. Uh, I'd like to begin by submitting uh, for the record a letter from Congressman Don Young on the House side uh, who is interested in commenting uh, on the subject matter of this hearing. We'll do that without objection. Um, I also wanted to just mention, you know, Senator Whitehouse and some of the testimony at the beginning of the hearing today talks about the importance of a cooperative attitude, a cooperative relationship. We couldn't agree more. And I think that every member of this committee on both sides of the aisle certainly thinks that that's important. That's the goal. Um, and in many ways, that's what the hearing's about, how we get there, how we get there. And... Um, I think that that's a goal that we all share. And uh, the ranking member mentioned Dan Ash. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We'd certainly be glad to have the head of Fish and Wildlife Service. As a matter of fact, he's testified in front of the full committee here. He testified in September in front of a subcommittee here. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think any of the members of the other side of the aisle uh, attended that. So uh, we'll have Mr. Ash here again to uh, be able to answer some of these questions. But what we wanted to do today is actually not have government witnesses, to have some of the practitioners who I think can help bring an objective um, view and a view from the states where this issue is really having the most impact. So, Mr. Reagan, I wanted to uh, start with a question. In 2014, the AFWA published a report entitled Wildlife Management Authority, the state agency's perspective. Can you explain what led to the drafting uh, of that report and what recommendations it includes and how that relates to the topic that we're discussing today? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I'll be glad to, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I have a copy here to submit for the record. Without, without objection. Thank you. Well, um, I'll say just a couple of things here about this. Uh, first of all, I've been the executive director um, at the association for seven years now. And, and throughout that seven years uh, of my tenure here in D.C., there have been ebbs and flows to the concerns uh, about the extent to which federal and state agencies uh, collaborate effectively. Um, I would say, as I said in my opening remarks, by and large, there's a great record of collaboration and a, a partnership across the state federal spectrum. But like with any uh, family uh, situation, if you will, there are issues that manifest themselves that create challenges and stresses in working through issues. This particular document that you're referring to, Mr. Chairman, um, is really the product of those kinds of ebbs and flows um, over the past seven years since I've been at AFWA. And um, our president at the time uh, wanted to put some of these issues to rest. Uh, he appointed a task force, uh, which was chaired by the state director from Arizona and comprised of state directors to take a look at the broad spectrum of federal laws, regulations, policies, and other kinds of guidance with respect 
to how state fish and wildlife agencies do their work. This document is the product of that committee's work. It was approved by the state membership um, at an annual meeting um, two years ago and, and summarizes uh, our best take on that relationship. And so what was the impetus behind it? Do you think there was a, a um, relationship between the state and federal government in this area that needed to be addressed? Yeah, I would, you know, I would say there, these ebbs and flows, these tensions that emerge uh, over either public lands management policy, wilderness policy, uh, differing perspectives in different parts of the country by different regional line staff or administrators, um, coupled with some of the challenges that just go with working through hard issues like um, uh, Endangered Species Act listings and, and that sort of thing. So it was really driven not by any one particular issue, but just the overall perception that there was an, always this undercurrent ebbing and flowing of concern about the state-federal relationship. I'll, I'll perhaps conclude, Mr. Chairman, if I might, by um, not only referring to this document, but this document has actually helped set the stage for a couple of different executive leadership retreats, both with state agency leaders and leaders within the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, create a better dialogue, if you will, prior to issues becoming um, as big as they might. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vincent, Vincent Lang, you, um, uh, Mr. Barry actually mentioned the 1982 MOU between uh, the Department of Fish and Game in Alaska and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Are you familiar with that uh, MOU and do you think that that is being abided by in the light in which it was drafted? Um, I am familiar with that MOU and, and actually when, when I was director of the Wildlife Division Conservation Alaska Department of Fish and Game, we tried to work with our federal partners in the Fish and Wildlife Service to implement that MOU. Unfortunately, much of the terms weren't being abided to by the federal government. For instance, we, were given, we weren't given opportunities to go out and access fish and wildlife to be able to monitor those fish and wildlife populations. And that access exists, that right to do that exists under the Statehood Act and ANILCA and many other federal laws, correct? Correct, and is also acknowledged under the MOU. So in essence, that MOU is there, but it doesn't really work as well as it intended. The other thing I'd like to point out is that the MOU says that we're going to manage for natural diversity. And the state of Alaska does manage for natural diversity. But the state of Alaska considers ecosystems as a functional part and humans as being a functional part of that ecosystem. So we manage those ecosystems for human benefits. And I think when we signed that MOU back in 82, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the federal government agreed that humans were a functional part of that ecosystem. Now what we're seeing instead is that the Fish and Wildlife Service believes that the humans are a threat to ecosystems and they're increasingly managing for natural diversity to minimize human impact on, on species. And I think that's a fundamental difference in Alaska. We continually to manage for manage ecosystems for human benefits. The federal government is managing ecosystems to minimize human impact on those ecosystems. Thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to say to the um, chairman that one of the um, traditions of the Senate is that when there is a home state issue with uh, a senator, we tend to try to rally around one another. and. Uh, if something were going badly wrong in Rhode Island, I would hope that you would be willing to help me, and in the same spirit, I would. to the extent there are issues uh, in Alaska where I can be helpful, I would like to um, try to be helpful also. I do think it is important, and I do think that where there are problems, they may not be nationwide problems, um, but local problems are real problems, as, uh, as, as you know very well. Um, I'd like to just uh, shift my questioning a little bit. Let me start with... Um, Let me start with uh, Dr. L Vincent Lang. Um, could you tell me what the, uh, you're here representing Safari Club International? Yes, I'm representing Safari Club International. What does Safari Club International, uh, what's its position on uh, global climate change? Well, I think Safari Club International believes that global climate change is occurring, but that you can mitigate those actions through a variety of different um, means. For instance, you, you can, uh, climate 
is affecting wildlife in a variety of different manners. So just like any other stressor, climate change is one of those stressors that we as managers will manage for. It's no greater or no lesser than any other stressor. So for instance, we'll manage climate for in the short and long term as we would any other hunting pressure or anything else that would affect the long-term sustainable use of wildlife in, on, on our state lands that we manage. So again, I think we're managing it as any other stressor that occurs out there. And you've described it, at least your organization has as a major concern. I'm reading from your website. Would that be accurate? What, what I'm saying is that I believe that it's a, it's a concern but it's no more or no greater of a concern than any other stressor that we're doing in terms of managing wildlife. In the short term, there's so probably not greater major, stressors that you are You disagree with the wildlife. Safari Club International website statement that it's a major concern? I, I didn't say that. I said it is not the most significant concern. Okay, it is but a it concern, is a major but concern. But in the short term, there may be more significant concerns that are affecting wildlife. But it's a concern like any other concern term, that we need to look, need to look at over the long term. In the long term, can you think of any that are more likely to affect wildlife? Um, I think as you're moving forward in time, I think human use of, of wildlife is something that we all need to consider. So for instance, I think one of the, the longer term impacts of, of managing wildlife is gonna be managing wildlife in the human, in the urban um, interface. So for instance, you know, we've been very successful at restoring wildlife over the last 150 years now I think one of the stressors is going to be how are we going to turn that success into managing wildlife at the urban interface. The coyote is in my trash. Yes. Uh, Mr. Barry, uh, global climate change, major concern? Absolutely. In what way does it well, bear on <clears throat> the protection of wildlife? From a from a wildlife conservation point of view, I would say it's one of the, one of the biggest concerns, if not the biggest concern. Um, it's, it's going to cause a huge disruption in migration patterns. I think in, along the uh, uh, northeastern coastline, you have migratory birds that come back. They've been coming up back probably since time immemorial, and they've been arriving at a certain time because that's when, say, um, uh, some of the crabs pop up. Um, and talking all Delaware sudden, now. Yeah, and all of a sudden it's, it's out of sync, and so yeah. the birds are coming back and the food supply is not there. Um, we're seeing this with other migratory patterns. Um, they're being disrupted. Um, food sources are being disrupted. Um, up in Alaska, polar bears are in big trouble um, because of climate change. So we think from a wildlife conservation point of view, it's, it's probably the largest long-term big-time threat. Mr. Regan, major concern for wildlife? Yeah, I, I would say it's a major concern. Um, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has uh, one dedicated staff person. You have a whole climate change committee, don't you? We have a climate change committee, and but we you have- take it seriously. Pardon me? You take it seriously. Yes, we take it seriously, and we're working uh, with federal agencies and states, of course, to think about climate change adaptation and providing tools and best management practices to help the states think through the adaptive challenges uh, for the future. You're all wonderful people, but as the senator here from the Ocean State, let me urge that we not forget the oceans. We're a terrestrial species, but we get a lot from the oceans in terms of cooling of the planet, oxygenation of the atmosphere, fish that we eat, and um, I think the place where we might be hitting our ecosystem the hardest is actually in the oceans. Mr. Chairman, back to you. And I agree with my ranking member on the importance of the oceans. So you see we have a lot of bipartisan agreement on these issues. <laughs> Senator Rounds. We may be the ocean state, but Senator Sullivan actually has more ocean. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Reagan, in your testimony, you discussed the conflict between the uh, South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks and the Park Service Management at Wind Cave National Park. And I'm curious about this because of the, uh, the, the, the fact that it has to do with a, a, a U.S. or a South Dakota Fish and Wildlife Agency. The GFMP would prefer to use hunters to manage the elk population in this particular national park. Um, however, the Park Service has found that th this proposal to hunt them was unacceptable due to statutory prohibitions against hunting in the park. Further, when the park informed game fishing parks that they would, and this is the Park Service, that they would cull the elk, which in South Dakota terms means that they would shoot them and let them lay. Um, 
Only after significant disagreement from the Game Fish and Park did the park agree to consider allowing the culled elk protein to be distributed to needy South Dakota families. But that decision has not been made yet. In fact, they have not been able to come to an agreement yet with the Park Service. I suspect that this is part of the reason why the, the, the state game, fish, and parks departments get frustrated sometime with their federal partners who sometimes don't seem to be partnering with them in anything that is considered close to being a, a, uh, a, a local um, uh, concern. Uh, while modifying the parks authorizing legislation to allow hunting as a management tool would solve the problem in Wind Cave National Park, it is not a comprehensive solution to statewide wildlife management, nor is it a solution to the tension between state and national park service or Fish and Wildlife Service officials. State officials know how to best manage wildlife in our state, and they should be the chief decision makers when deciding how best to conserve our wildlife. The debate over how to manage elk or an elk population has now spanned several years in this particular case with no solution to the overpopulation of elk. South Dakota GFMP reached out to the Park Service in late 2015 to set up a meeting, but the Park Service has yet to confirm a date to continue this conversation. How do these types of long-standing disagreements between state and federal officials over wildlife management impact the overall health of the wildlife population that we all propose to want to protect? Well, that, that's a big question, <laughs> Senator. Um, I, I think I'll start by saying that um, w when I first began my career uh, with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department um, about 30 years ago, um, the state of Vermont Fish and Wildlife Agency was having a terrible time working with the U.S. Forest Service on the Green Mountain National Forest. And the, uh, the, the agency heads in that situation almost came to blows over whether or not certain kinds of trees should be cut on the forest uh, for timber or potentially to the detriment of the white-tailed deer resource um, in the state of Vermont. And so um, these kinds of uh, issues emerge. Um, I think, you know, what they, I think at the end of the day, uh, what, what's really required is, is a major commitment to think about science, uh, to think about partnerships, to think about working through issues. Um, unfortunately, with uh, turnover in agencies, the bureaucracies of managing issues, and then not to mention the overlay of the judicial system and how sometimes professional management is taken away from the professional managers. I'm just curious, uh, do you see anything that a, a, a change in law or a change in statute or a directive in terms of the regulatory processes, anything that could be done to, to basically uh, reach or to help reach a long-term solution to reinforce the state's officials' ability to, uh, to control and manage the wildlife populations in their own states? Uh, yes, Senator, and, and of course I, I pointed out a couple of those in my oral testimony. Uh, there's more detail uh, in the written narrative, uh, but the whole notion of revisiting and making sure the, the savings clauses are contemporary and adequate uh, for the future when thinking about state management authority. Um, in my written testimony, you'll note that uh, sometimes these saving clauses uh, find their way at the end of legislation as opposed to being on the front end, and it's our opinion when that occurs. Uh, the courts may not give them the kind of deference that they should in thinking through decisions. <clears throat> yeah, and then we also suggest uh, another remedy um, concerning uh, close collaboration or coordination with the states. With the chair's indulgence, I have one more very quick question. Are, are you aware of any other cases where U.S. Fish and Wildlife or Park Service officials have recommended the culling or killing of a game animal and then simply suggesting that they be allowed to rot where they're, where they're shot? Um, off the top of my head, no. Thank you. Chairman Inhofe. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was really coming down here for two purposes. One, to learn a little bit more about Alaska. And the other is if you're to let this committee know and the witnesses know that the problems that uh, you have up there are not unique to Alaska. Yeah. 
because uh, we've had uh, similar problems. I, there's a thing called the Sykes Act that uh, the Secretary of Defense, in co collaboration with the Fish and Wildlife, would take care of the wildlife on, on military uh, establishments. Are you familiar with that, uh, Mr. Lang? Yes, I am. Is, is that working pretty well? At times it works well, and at times it doesn't work very well. But I think it works better than, than the Refuge System Improvement Act, because yeah. it clearly recognizes state authority. Uh -huh. are, you, are any of you familiar with the lesser prairie chicken uh, issue? That is, it's uh, unique to five states, Oklahoma, uh, Colorado, Kansas, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, we had, and th what really disturbs me about this, is we have a five-state plan that goes out for the purpose of, of taking care and evaluating what's happening to the lesser uh, prairie chicken. Five states all agreed and signed off on this. This is the very best that we have. And landowners, we had landowners. Somehow there's this perception that if you're a landowner, you're a rancher, that somehow you, you don't want to conserve. And that's just so wrong. One of the few really good things that has worked is the partnership program. But in this case, we had five states, we had the experts in those states, the landowners, uh, stakeholders in those, uh, those states, all agreeing that we have taken done a very good job with the lesser prairie chicken, and that in the, between the years of 2014 and 2015, our population <coughs> of prairie chickens actually increased by, by um, uh, well, let me see what it is here, because they were very specific on that. 20, yeah, 25 percent, 25 percent. That doesn't get any better than that, does it? And yet they went ahead and, and gave an endangerment uh, listing. I, I just think uh, we have an example in Oklahoma of what you're saying, <coughs> what, what does work and what doesn't work. Can you tell me, uh, how about you, Mr. Regan, the logic behind that decision in spite of the effort that went into and the successes that we had? So you're talking about the prairie chicken? Yeah, I am. Uh, Less Senator. prairie chicken. So, I, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we, we were clearly disappointed um, as state agencies that, that a threat enlisting um, was um, provided for by the, by the federal government. But on the other hand, that was certainly better than managing to an endangered listing. Well, no, that's, that's not the point. The point is, any listing at all, when the population's increased and you had the very best of not just one state, but five states right. agreeing. And by the way, I might add, so did the members of the United States Senate from all five of the states, of which uh, some were uh, Democrats and some were Republicans. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the, the, the key storylines there, uh, aside from the listing decision, was, was, the, was the ability of those five states, including your home state, Senator, uh, to come together uh, with a proactive landscape level voluntary conservation program to secure and manage prairie chicken habitat for the future. And I think that's the big uh, plus up or uh, bottom line story which shows the ability of the states to come together and demonstrate a willingness and an effectiveness to grapple with, with a large uh, landscape scale conservation issue. And yet they, they still came to the conclusion that that's correct. Needed to be, yeah, well, that's, right. that's my whole point. Yes. I, see, I agree with the, everything you said up to that point. Oh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Inhofe. Uh, Senator Barrasso. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. If we can start, uh, Mr. Regan, with uh, uh, a couple of questions. Actually, you know, in 2014, the Senate and Congressional Western Caucus released a report uh, entitled Washington Gets It Wrong. Uh, and the states get it right. The, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a report on state environmental stewardship and run through what happens nationally as well as what's happening uh, locally and how we think that the states continue to do a much better job than Washington. It highlights the significant boots on the ground in terms of biologists, scientists in states in the West like Wyoming. Uh, we have uh, nearly 300 people in Wyoming, biologists, scientists, support staff at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Uh, they live and work in Wyoming, not in Washington. Uh, they live where the species live. Uh, there are people in my state that have pledged to protect our species, including the gray wolf population. So, you know, I think these dedicated men, are women, men and women really should be the ones uh, that we should be entrusting to, uh, to protect Wyoming's wildlife. And could you give me your thoughts on that? Well, uh, certainly, Senator. Um, first of all, good afternoon. 
you know, we certainly agree that, that state fish and wildlife agency managers are on, are on the front lines of enforcement and delivering fish and wildlife conservation in this country. That's what the association's all about, trying to make sure no harm is done onto that principle, that delivery, um, and that conservation effectiveness for the future. And then, uh, Mr. Barry, your organization says in your wolf plan entitled uh, Places for Wolves, a Blueprint for Continued Wolf Restoration Recovery in the Lower 48, uh, you say, quote, no matter how ideal the habitat, however, it is ultimately up to the people to determine if wolves will be allowed to survive in any given area. Well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has said that the gray wolf is recovered and that the agency has approved the plan the state of Wyoming has put together to ensure the, production of, the, the protection of Wyoming's wolves. Uh, so if it's up to the people to protect the wolves, why, I wonder why won't outside activist groups like your organization not allow the people of Wyoming to protect our wolves if the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approves of the management plan and the science says the gray wolf is recovered? Well, um, Senator, a district court judge disagreed that the Fish and Wildlife Service had appropriately um, made the right now, what findings. was that what the district court judge wasn't in Wyoming doesn't really know Wyoming doesn't have an ability to understand this situation really didn't study it I'm just saying that a federal judge when um, given a chance to review the record concluded the Fish and Wildlife Service and appropriately delisted the wolf was what was the scientific bas basis for that do you I know I couldn't tell you off the top yeah, of well it wasn't I haven't seen the record okay so you're not familiar with with the specifics of the case not the specifics okay Good. and probably <laughs> be happy with that mr. Uh, Lang, uh, you shared many of the same concerns that Mr. Regan raised in his testimony. Uh, in Alaska and across the West, the federal government is increasingly requiring the public and the states to take a hands-off approach to public lands. Uh, this means having the public and the states have less interaction and access to public lands. So would you agree that ultimately this hands-off approach to wildlife and public lands management uh, could be detrimental to conservation of the very species that we all work to preserve if, if Washington bureaucrats kind of on the other side of the country are calling all the shots? Thank you, Senator Brasser. Um, the, the conservation model, the state conservation model is built on a user pay system. And the further you separate those users from the benefits that they're going to gain off those systems, the less they're going to be want, willing to pay and over the long term pay for the management and conservation of those resources. That model is, is the Pittman Robertson Fund and the Dingle Johnson Fund. So you have to provide benefits off, off, off um, refuges and parklands across our nation. If you don't, they're going to become areas that of not concern to people and people aren't going to be willing to pay for the, pay for the long term protection and conservation of those areas. And hunters are some of the largest payers of conservation in our nation. So the more, you, you can't exclude people from the management of resources. I guess that's the bottom line I want to say. And increasingly as I'm seeing the Fish and Wildlife Service's management model, it's viewing people as a threat, not as an integral part and not something you need to provide benefits for. And in my state, if you're living in a rural lifestyle, yeah far away and you're, and you're dependent upon local resources for your food, you can't let just nature's cycles going up and down provide for that. You can't have a decade where there's no moose near your village. You have to manage for sustained moose populations. And having, for instance, that, that example I gave, caribou blinking out on Unimac Island, that's not good for hunters on Unimac Island, certainly not good for subsistence users, to allow them to someday in some century from now, swim back out to that island and reestablish a caribou population. Great. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Barrasso. I, I have a couple follow-up questions, um, and I want to actually just mention, you know, my, my uh, colleague, Senator Whitehouse, mentioned uh, the tradition in the Senate uh, on, you know, when we have an issue here. Actually, the proposed Fish and Wildlife Service rule that came out on January 8th was solely focused on Alaska. And in the hearing where we had an amendment to um, cancel out that rule, I actually specifically asked members of this committee by using the example saying, hey, if there was a federal rule dealing with the California movie industry only or the Maryland crab industry only, or the Delaware chemical industry only, I certainly would help my colleagues on the, on the committee 
And this Fish and Wildlife Service dealt with an Alaska fish and game management issue only. So I would agree with Senator Whitehouse's comment about the Senate colleagues rallying around each other when there's a federal action that's specific only to your state. Unfortunately, in our last hearing, that uh, didn't happen, which is one of the reasons we wanted to hold this hearing, but to talk about the broader issue. But focusing on that regulation, um, Mr. Vincent Lang, in your testimony, you talked about that proposed January 8th uh, Fish and Wildlife Service rule um, will allow the federal government to preempt state hunting regulations based on their personal ethics or personal preference. What Can you explain that a little bit more and can you give an example of what you were talking about? Let's look at the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. You know, that refuge was originally established as a moose range before it was established as a National Wildlife Refuge. And it was a presidential executive order that says you have to maintain a significant population of moose in that, on that former moose range, now a refuge. Under the natural diversity guidelines, the state of Alaska is now being told that we have to let moose cycle in their natural cycles on that range. We can no longer manage them, provide for the long-term benefits that have been provided, including subsistence. We could see moose numbers go incredibly low, low enough that there's no hunt, harvestable surplus for hunters, or very high where they could actually damage the, the refuge and the foods that food base that they need to, to stay sustainable. So the state of Alaska, we want to actively manage that moose population to provide for human benefits, including subsistence use and, and hunt, hunt, harvestable surplus. We don't want that population to widely fluctuate. So in working with the service, we're being increasingly we're growing increasingly frustrated with the inability to manage fire, which is a habitat component, manage the predator numbers, which are an incredible in, important number in terms of how they affect moose numbers. And it's all, again, driven around these natural diversity guidelines where human interference onto the National Wildlife Refuge System is increasingly disallowed versus the state's approach to manage actively to provide for long-term sustained yield and benefits. What did you mean by personal preference, personal ethics, when you were talking about that as a part of the rule. Okay, um, let's go again on to the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. The Fish and Wildlife Service has determined that baiting of brown bears is, is not an ethical practice for the taking of brown bears. Even though it's not affecting the long-term conservation of brown bears on the refuge, they've determined that you no longer can hunters practice the traditional practice of, which we've done for years on the Kenai, of taking brown bears over bait. On, near the refuge. And the reason the state of Alaska Institute... Is there a law that outlaws that? The, they have administratively banned it, and they're banning it through these kinds of administrative regulations that you're seeing here. So the state of Alaska largely adopted that bear baiting practice to, to soften some of the interactions we were having with local communities who were having increased problems with human bear interactions. We were seeing increased numbers of maulings and a variety of other things. Interesting enough, though, that this, when the service banned the taking of brown bears over bait, they allowed the continued practice of taking black bears over bait. And so, so it's very confusing as to why brown bears, the taking of brown bears over bait would be disallowed, but the taking of black bears would continue to be allowed. And doesn't the, does the Fish and Wildlife Service, do they employ predator control activities, um, even though they've dis prohibited the state of Alaska to use predator management activities? That's, that's an interesting observation because when I was director, one of the things we worked with closely with the service on is to ensure that pigeon guillemots, which is a seabird that occurs in Prince William Sound, didn't become extirpated from an island in Prince William Sound. And very similar to CAG Alaska, where, I mean, um, Unamac Island, where we have a caribou population at risk of ex extinction from that island because of wolf predation, here we have a, we're not going to lose caribou overall in, in, on the Aleutians. It's a very small area, we're going to lose them, but we want to take active steps. In Prince William Sound, it's very similar with pigeon guillemots. They're going to be potentially extirpated from an island because of mink predation. The Fish and Wildlife Service came to us and asked us for a permit to go exterminate these mink from this island to allow for the restoration and prevent the extirpation of these pigeon guillemots from the island. We worked very closely with them and gave, the, gave them that permit to go do that. So 
We're very confused why we can't take any steps to actively manage on Unimac Island to prevent the extirpation of a caribou herd, but yet the service can go in and actively manage state mink, which are indigenous to that island, from, from potentially harming and causing the extirpation of pigeon gillamans from an island. Let me uh, kind of step back a little bit more with regard to the, the proposed fish and wildlife rule that's been a source of a lot of concern in Alaska, but I think even nationally. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service claimed that the proposed rules won't affect Title VIII of ANILCA, the federally uh, defined rural subsistence users category in ANILCA. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't, because, again, it's this passive management approach that we're increasingly going to be moving to. And as I said earlier, if you're living a rural lifestyle in, in Alaska, you need a steady source of food. You don't need a food source that's going to fluctuate widely with cycles of nature. And can you explain to, because I, I honestly, I don't think most people in Washington, D.C. at a hearing like this understand what subsistence actually means. Okay, well, picture And your, so explain what, if somebody doesn't have the right to subsist with regard to fishing or hunting, what happens to them possibly in the winter? Do they have a store to go to down the street and fill up their freezer? Well, picture yourself living in some of the, it, the, the... The thing that I like to say is, when you're in Alaska, there's not a road running to your place. Every place in the lower 48, almost every community has a road going to it. You can drive to a store to get something. Now picture yourself in Alaska. You're oftentimes three hours by plane to get to the nearest grocery store or anything else. And in the wintertime, there's no guarantee you're going to get there. You rely on food sources for your very substance for you and your family's substance. Now, how would you like to be told that we're not going to guarantee you that that, that substance is going to be there for you because we're not going to actively manage for it? We're not going to allow you to, to no longer control the number of wolves or bears near your area. Instead, we're going to allow moose numbers to go way down, insufficient numbers to provide food for you and your family. That You're going to starve. It's, it's not a matter of... of Going to a grocery store is an alternative food source. It's a matter of social justice. You've got to be able to eat, and that's the food that you have, living off the land. Well, I appreciate that, and I think that's why these hearings are important, because I don't think that those kind of issues uh, come up in other states all the time. Maybe they do in some states, but uh, I don't think they do in a lot of states. So I think that that kind of testimony is powerful. It also helps us understand some of the issues at play here. Mr. Berry, I want to just ask you, in terms of and this, again, goes to the issue of working with the states and other organizations. The National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, has proposed a number of regs uh, over the course of the last several years. Um, has your organization um, been provided an opportunity to input or review the draft documents of these kind of regs or EAs that have come from some of these federal agencies? Well, I certainly haven't, personally, and I have no idea um, whether anybody on my staff has been. I'm not aware of, uh, of us being given any advanced copies to take a look at or to critique. Okay, and, and I do want to mention, and maybe that doesn't happen with you, one of the things that's been a huge frustration of mine, an enormous source of frustration, which I think goes to the federalism issues, which are the broader topic of today's hearing, is that there have been a number of occasions where the Department of Interior, different federal agencies, announcements, proposed rules um, that clearly impact states, uh, the states are literally the last people to know. So there are outside groups, uh, some outside environmental groups that clearly get heads up from our federal agencies, get a chance to discuss them with federal officials, have press releases that go out as soon as the federal government makes these announcements, and the states, which are often in statute required to be consulted and have input, the number one priority organization, we get told last. And I think it's an enormous frustration, something I've certainly raised with uh, different officials, including Secretary Jewell, but uh, it's an issue that I think we need to continue to work on. The purpose of what we're trying to talk about in today's hearing is how important the states are in terms of their relationship with the federal government in terms of management, but also in terms of what the federal statutes require the federal agencies to do in terms of state input. Senator Whitehouse. 
Thanks, Chairman. Uh, two observations in closing. One in sympathy with uh, Senator Rounds and the elk having to rot where they're shot. We have, uh, on the fishery side, as you know, uh, situations in which our fishermen are allowed to go out and trawl for fish. And when the net comes in, there are fish that have been caught. And if you've ever been out, uh, being at the back of a trawl after a long trawl is not a good situation for a fish. So when they come out of the trawl, they're not doing well. Yet the fishermen are not allowed to keep certain of them because they're not permitted for it. And so uh, they have to go over the side. And some of them are really beautiful. And uh, they are not going to survive. And it's, um, it's a shame. It's just a straight up waste. And we've tried to work through programs so that they can be taken in and frozen, and given to people who are in need of food and so forth. But it's a constant challenge, and I think it's a place where uh, we can and should do better. Um, the second point that I wanted to make is that I want to push a little bit back on a theme that has begun to emerge in this hearing, that um, it is always the local community that is the best determinant of the conservation interest. Um, I think that's probably usually true, but if you think back to the era of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, he faced situations in which enormous natural bounty uh, out in our country was being despoiled and ruined because the mining interests, the timber interests, the wholesale hunting interests had gotten control of state legislatures. And they were out essentially ransacking and plundering the West. And it took TR to step in and protect those resources, which we still enjoy today. Now, that's not going to be the case every time, but neither is it the case every time that the federal government has no proper role. In fact, one of the better biographies of Teddy Roosevelt described him as the wilderness warrior, because he had uh, fought to preserve these areas of wilderness. So I think we need to look towards uh, balance uh, between the federal interest and the state interest. We need to pay particular attention to the state interest where there's an appearance that there is a political control that's being abused. Um, and I think we need to pay very close attention to people whose lives depend on these resources in remote areas that many of us are not familiar with. And I think if we can stay within those principles, we can find a lot of common ground. Yep. Well, I, I think the ranking member for those comments, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with those. Let me just finish by just uh, in relating to that. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Vincent Lang, uh, Mr. Barry described some of the refugees as game factories for sport hunters, I think, early in his testimony. Do you, do you think that that's how, for example, when you were the head of fish and game in Alaska, is that how you managed uh, uh, federal lands for game factories for sport hunters? No, I don't think we manage them as game refuges at all. I think we manage them for multiple use benefits, but we certainly did manage them for human benefit. We didn't manage them just for nature's benefit. But let me they weren't ask, managed solely as game, game factories. Mr. Reagan, uh, I, I mentioned this rule, and it's been a, a focus of mine for obvious reasons, uh, given the state and the people I represent. But this Fish and Wildlife Service proposed rule that was the subject of an amendment in this committee a couple of weeks ago, as I mentioned, it is specific to Alaska. But given the breadth of your organization and who you represent, should other states be concerned by this kind of um, specific rule that's focused on one state from the federal government in terms of game management? And if so, why? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and clearly that's why the association um, is in fact involved. Um, we are concerned um, that if this policy guidance on biodiversity is elevated to being a regulation for refuges in Alaska, uh, that's going to create um, a new standard, if you will, uh, for judicial engagement, and we could see potentially the export um, of that rule to Alaska, from Alaska to other national wildlife refuges in the lower 48. And to the extent that that would perpetuate or continue to compromise state authority, uh, 
um, that's the real nexus for our, our engagement with the issue right now. And let me just ask more specifically, in the National Wildlife Refuge System Administration Act, it assigns the Secretary 14 responsibilities when administrating, uh, administering the refuge system. The rule that we're talking about with regard to Alaska, the Secretary clearly seems to be prioritizing one of these responsibilities and defining it in a regulation. Again, do you think that that's appropriate and does that have an impact beyond just Alaska from your organization's perspective? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we don't think it's needful. Uh, we don't think it's appropriate, and we think it could impact other states beyond Alaska. For the same reason that you just mentioned in your earlier answer? That's correct. Great. Thank you. Well, listen, I want to thank the witnesses. You've been very patient. I want to thank you all for your service over the years. I know many of you have engaged and in, in participated in public service in different capacities, and I think this was a very useful hearing. A lot of substance here, a lot of potential common ground on some of these issues. And um, I want to again thank you for coming here, taking the time to testify, and enlightening the committee on a number of important issues. This hearing is adjourned.